Yeah, so this is a series of fortunate events, our open source tool of solutions for scaling Prometheus. This is uh, Grafana's little mascot, Grot, here, uh, helpfully with a logo from the con on his hat. Uh, as Faisal said, my name is Eamon Ryan. I'm a senior principal field engineer uh, at Grafana Labs. I've uh, been at Grafana for uh, almost four years now, um, literally like two weeks away from four years, uh, which is an eternity in re relation to the company. Link. Um, but yeah, we get to work a lot of cool uh, technology there. Big fans of Prometheus. Uh, Grafana actually employs uh, over 40% of the Prometheus maintainers. Um, so we're big, big fans of it. We build a lot of solutions around it and to work with it. Um, and lots of them open source, of course, which is what I'm here to talk to you about today. Uh, so I have a little disclosure up front. Uh, obviously, I work at Grafana Labs. One of the main solutions I'm going to talk about that helps you scale Prometheus is a project that's built and maintained by Grafana Labs. Uh, that might create concerns of obvious bias, uh, which is why I'm not actually going to recommend a particular one at the end. I'm going to showcase a couple of uh, like more main contenders that includes ours, but I'm not going to tell you to use a specific one. Um, I'm going to tell you about a few things about the different ones to help you make a choice there, but I'm not going to say one is objectively better because uh, they're not. And if I said our one was the best one, you'd say I was biased. If I said somebody else's one was the best one, you'd think I was not planning to have a job for very long, probably. Um, so I'm going to try to keep it unbiased. I'm just going to talk about objectively true things and then you can take that information and kind of make your own decision from there. <coughs> so, um, in case you walked into a talk about uh, scaling Prometheus and uh, you haven't actually touched Prometheus before, uh, just a quick refresher. First of all, who uses Prometheus in the room? Everybody, okay, almost everybody. Not everybody's hand is up. Um, so Prometheus is an open source time series database solution. Uh, it implements a multi-dimensional data model. So all time series are identified by a metric name and a set of key value pairs. And then, you know, obviously a value for a metric. Um, PromQL, which is the query language, lets you slice and dice uh, the collected time series data uh, so that you can generate ad hoc graphs, uh, tables and alerts and all that good stuff that we need to keep things running. Uh, Prometheus has, whoops, it's too far. Prometheus has a few different modes for visualizing data. It has a built-in uh, query uh, browser UI, uh, which is a bit more limited, but it does function if you were just trying to verify that a query is, is uh, usable and does return. Uh, the most common way I see people talking to Prometheus is via Grafana, um, but that's not the only way you can do it, but Grafana does give you a lot more visualization options than you would otherwise have. And then, of course, you can address Prometheus directly via its own APIs and pull out whatever data you want uh, in that manner as well. Uh, it's got pretty efficient storage, so it stores time series in memory uh, and on the local disk in a really efficient custom format. Uh, you can scale it in uh, using Prometheus Federation, which I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, but it has limitations there. Uh, each uh, server that you run in Prometheus is independent, uh, so from a reliability perspective, they only rely on each other uh, and on their local storage. Uh, it's all written in Go, uh, very easy to deploy. You can deploy it on Linux, you can deploy it in a container on Docker, you can deploy it in a Kubernetes cluster. Doesn't really matter, it works on all of them, although don't run it on NFS storage. Uh, it doesn't like that. <laughs> uh, it'll actually warn you if you try and start an NFS and it will run, but it will tell you that your stuff will get corrupted and it's not lying, it does do that. Um, let's see, uh, alerts are defined in Prometheus's uh, PromQL language and they maintain all the dimensions and you can send alerts to alert manager and deal with notifications and silences and all that. Uh, it's got a ton of client libraries if you want to instrument metrics for Prometheus. Uh, 10 different languages, over 10 are supported and you can add custom libraries and do your own custom instrumentation pretty easily. And uh, there is a bunch of existing exporters and integrations that allow you to pull in third-party data uh, into Prometheus. So if you have something that does not uh, output data in a Prometheus format, and it's something that at least other people use, it's not something you built totally in-house, there's probably an exporter for that out there that will convert uh, data into a Prometheus format that you could then ingest into Prometheus or something Prometheus compatible. So that's all the good stuff that you 
a lot of you probably already know ab about Prometheus, but it has some limitations. And these limitations aren't necessarily um, deficiencies of the project, they're just uh, non-goals of the project. So they're not things that the project was necessarily ever set out to solve, leaving those things to be solved by other solutions, which is why we're here today. So the first is around size. So Prometheus is a single process uh, or single machine, which means you can only scale up, so which means you can add CPU, you can add memory, you can add disk, but you can't scale out. You can't run a cluster of Prometheus servers. You can run a HA pair, but that's not a cluster. So you might be in a position where your metric needs are growing in your work, in your company, in your house. Maybe you have a really big house, a lot of stuff. And you keep adding CPU, you keep adding memory, and now this is like too big for a machine or you're running it inside of a cloud provider like AWS and you're, you're doing bigger and bigger uh, Amazon instances. And maybe you go all the way up to, uh, you know, something like this, the R7 a.metal48xl with uh, 192 CPUs and uh, over one and a half terabytes of RAM. And that's still not enough. And you know, maybe it's still gone on fire and exploding and falling over. Uh, I have seen this. I have spoken to a customer who did this and literally was at the largest AWS instance you could get with like some number of millions of series inside it and it was still falling over. And then they came to talk to us about it. So people do do this, but eventually you run out of headroom. There's only so far you can go. Uh, so if, if you then run up to the top of what you can fit in one machine, what do you end up doing? You end up having uh, more than one. So you have a second server, and maybe you send half your metrics to server B and half your metrics to server A, and that works okay. Um, but uh, maybe that results in a scenario where now you have, okay, you have two, or maybe you have four, maybe you have six, maybe you have eight, and you connect you know, all eight of those up to one Grafana instance, and now what happens when you're trying to find metrics from those servers? Uh, which data source in Grafana are you going to query? So you're gonna be looking at Grafana going, oh, which one do I pick? Oh no, please help. And uh, you know, makes for a sad experience. Um, this is also something I see pretty commonly, so people add loads and loads of these servers, and then they either have to have the overhead of figuring out which one to query, or, they end up running some kind of proxy in front of it. So you can run, there's a project out there called, I don't know how to say it, it's prom XY, like prom proxy. Um, but the problem with that is if any of them are slow, then your response is always slow. So you, it becomes hard to identify where there's an issue, if there is an issue, because you're trying to query like N servers at once. So also not really a great kind of setup and one that co people commonly run into. Uh, the third limitation here is around retention. So if you've used open source Prometheus, you know that the retention is going to be a week, two weeks, three weeks, mostly. You can set it longer, but it doesn't really handle that very well. It's not designed to. And so if you wanted to run a query uh, inside of, say, Grafana for, that went back more than a week, you'll end up with you know, a graph like this where you only have as far back as your retention actually is. And you're standing here looking around for you know, the rest of the data inside your graph, and it's just not there. This took an unreasonably long amount of time to get that GIF in there properly. Uh, the next part is around uh, tenancy. So you have your Prometheus server here at the bottom. You might have you know, team one up here, team two, team three, team four, team five at your company, and they're all getting metrics sent into the same Prometheus server, but there's no segregation in there, and there's no limits. It's either on or it's off. Uh, aside from like rules you can make around filtering of metrics, but that's not really a tenancy. It's not really a team limiting thing. So you're effectively operating like you have just open floodgates all of the time, just pouring all these metrics into the one server, which means you can easily run into situations of um, like noisy neighbor teams. So one team just blows up the amount of metrics being sent into the system and now everyone else has to suffer because of that and they knock the whole thing over. And uh, the next limitation here is around HA and resiliency. I briefly mentioned uh, having a cluster before. So you might have two Prometheus servers that you run as a HA pair. Uh, but as I mentioned, like one of the early, early slides, they run totally independently of each other. So they don't know they're in a cluster. They're basically there with a brick wall between them and they have their own sets of config, their own sets of scrape targets, even if they're the same scrape targets, but they are maintained independently. They have separate disks, separate TSDBs, and I say no backfill here. <coughs> there is methods of backfilling data into Prometheus, 
but a HA pair does not sync itself. Like there's no automatic syncing of data. So if you take one down to upgrade it, it's missing data while it was down, comes back up, it doesn't get filled in by the other one. So that's something you have to manage yourself. It's a totally separate activity. So what do you do? Uh, what are you supposed to do to, to like s solve this problem? So there, if you go to Prometheus.io, there is a page of uh, integrated remote storage solutions for Prometheus. Uh, it looks like this. There's a lot of them. And uh, they're not all good candidates. And they're not all up-to-date candidates either. So this could be really misleading if you just looked at it at a glance. Um, as kind of a zeroth round elimination, ones that I'm not focusing on here out of this list are, first of all, things that are not open source, because we're at an open source conference. Things that are SaaS only, because they're usually, that usually goes hand in hand with not open source. Um, so you can't run it yourself. Um, and so that precludes things like Timestream, Azure Data Explorer, BigQuery, um, Splunk, Wavefront, all these kinds of things. So I'm not really going to focus on any of them. There are some items in here that I'm going to mention, because otherwise somebody at the end is going to go, but what about X? And I'm just going to head that off up front. So here's the first round eliminations. The other one wa was the zero with round, but here's the first round. So CrateDB is a SQL uh, performant database. It has a Prometheus adapter, which means it's able to accept data in Prometheus format, and it's able to translate a query in PromQL into the SQL format it needs to return the data. So on paper, it should work fine. Um, from what I could glean from it, I haven't used this. There's one maintainer. It's running on a 0.5.1 release version, which doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just means it hasn't existed for terribly, terribly long. I have never spoken to somebody who was using this, and so I didn't go into like further evaluation with it because there's just not many references of people actually using this for something. So maybe a future one, which is why I have that up there, but it's not part of the larger analysis I have here. Next one here is Elastic. You can actually write PromQL or Prometheus format metrics into Elastic, but you can't get them back out in Prometheus format. So they'll go in in Prometheus format, but then you have to query it in Elastic's query language, uh, which doesn't feel like a solution for scaling Prometheus. That's a solution for moving stuff out of Prometheus, essentially. Um, Elastic, as, you, as people probably already know, in observability world, changed their license to one that isn't OSI approved. So it doesn't really feel in the spirit of open source to have that in that list as well. Uh, Noki or Nochi, uh, this one lets you write data in, but doesn't let you read it out, kind of like Elastic. Um, so that's not ideal. There is a Grafana plugin for Nochi, but it's really, really old. It hasn't been updated in forever, so I'm not, I wouldn't say it even works still. Uh, do you know you could write prom Prometheus metrics into Graphite? I wouldn't recommend it, but you can. Um, so you can write it in, but you ca again, you can't read it out as Prometheus. Um, I don't know anybody moving on to Graphite. I only know people moving away from Graphite. <laughs> so I don't think that's a good direction to go in anyway, uh, but you could. Uh, grep time DB was an interesting one. I had never heard of it before I started writing this talk, um, but they are working towards a full PromQL compatibility. They're at 82.12% now. So it looks pretty promising, um, but by their own admission, like they're not like ready for like production prime time yet until they reach that point. But it, is, it does, does look like a cool project. So maybe the next time I do a version of this talk, that'll be further inside the deck. Uh, you can write PromQL, or not PromQL, Prometheus metrics into InfluxDB, and you can query them back out. There is plugins there, uh, but Influx decided that clustering in HA was no longer going to be in their OSS version, so that kind of precludes it from being a valid option for scaling Prometheus, I thought. Uh, M3DB, uh, I think previously used to be a really good uh, candidate for this. This is the one that was originally created at uh, Uber, uh, but they haven't had a release since April 2022. And that's unfortunate, but obviously you don't want to use something that hasn't been updated in two years. So I don't really think that's a good choice. Uh, similar for OpenTSDB, hasn't, been, hasn't had a release since 2021. Probably not a great option either. Doesn't look like people are still developing it. And PromScale, definitely not still being developed. That one was actually, that one actually has an announcement that says this is done now. Whereas the previous two don't, they just don't have any more uh, things going into them. But PromScale said, we're done, sorry, goodbye. Um, <coughs> so, that's all the first round ones. 
So uh, before I get into like the main four I ended up evaluating, I want to talk about Prometheus Federation. Is anybody here using Federation? Nobody. Good. Uh, I'll talk about it a little bit and why it's uh, not really the best solution for scaling. It has its uses, um, but for just scaling to a larger setup, it's only useful if you have a very specific setup in mind. So you might have, let's say, a bunch of Prometheus servers, and you could have a top-level Prometheus that's then going to reach out to uh, these servers on their Federate uh, endpoint, and it's able to choose which series it wants to pull in from the others into itself. Now, uh, that's great in a scenario where the top level one is meant to hold things like global aggregates, and then the other servers are meant to hold the more localized granular data. That's exactly what it's for. But if you were, going, if you were trying to go for a scenario like, oh, I just want to pull everything up into the top level one from all my like leaf Prometheus, which is the correct plural, by the way, um, from all, all, all my leaf Prometheus, then what's going to happen? It's still just a single process. So it's going to reach out to all these, pull in every series from all these Prometheus, and then you know it's still just one machine. So you end up in the please help scenario again. It'll just fall over. It's not, it's not some super magical thing. It's still data going into a system, and that system only scales vertically. So there is a, a runway that is only so long there. So uh, the Federation is like a lot of management and overhead at best. If you only have a small setup, it's okay. But can you imagine trying to figure this out for like 20 plus Prometheus servers and which things are being rolled up and which things are not? And now this becomes this like overhead nightmare. So that's why I don't really consider it a good contender here either. So the actual contenders I ended up with, uh, there's four. Uh, so we got Cortex, Victoria Metrics, Thanos, and Grafana Mimir. Um, as I said in the beginning, I'm trying to do this in a really unbiased way. Uh, I'm not even going to recommend a particular one, as I said. They're all very valid choices. Uh, I'm going to let you know their factual status on several criteria that I think are, are important when you're considering a production rollout of one of these, and then you make your own decision. All the information that I pulled out is coming from the public docs of each solution or something I found in the relevant GitHub of the project, which means if I'm wrong, it was wrong up there. So there's no opinions here. This is literally what I could just find online. So don't come attack me if you're really attached to one of these products. But if I'm wrong, do come tell me. And I'll tell you, I actually, in my speaker notes, have the link for where I found every bit of info. So I will link it to you, and you can go fix it. <laughs> uh, one other thing, so performance which you might think is the most important thing here, uh, isn't enough. I, there's a very recent article uh, on uh, motherduck.com called Performance is Not Enough. And there were two lines in it that I thought were really, really pertinent in this scenario. So one is that performance in general and general purpose benchmarking in particular is a poor way to choose a database. And I think that's so accurate because a lot of databases end up commoditizing further and further the longer that they exist. There isn't some you know, secret arcane art that some programmers know and some don't where they're going to make something 100 times more efficient than everybody else and nobody else can do it. If somebody finds out a novel new technique or a novel way of accomplishing a particular task that's way more efficient, the, its competitors are going to do that eventually too because that's just the natural way that stuff works. Somebody figures something out, people emulate it in their product, so the performance ends up converging over time. So solution A might be 30% faster in their newest release because they figured something out, but then B, C, and D will all move towards that level of speed in the next few releases anyway. That tends to be how it goes. So choosing a solution purely on who's performing fastest right now isn't necessarily going to help you when whatever choice you make, you're probably going to keep it for at least a few years and all the other ones are going to be at the same level anyway, or at least something close to it. So don't make performance your only criteria. The second line here is you're better off making decisions based on the ease of use, ecosystem, velocity of updates, and how well it integrates with your workflow. So can you use it in conjunction with your other tools? Is it still being actively updated and stuff actually gets fixed? Is it being updated to run on the latest versions of whatever dependencies it uses for security purposes as well? Is there a e good ecosystem of plugins around it? Um, is, it, is it portable? Does it introduce any kind of technical debt or lock-in? Like all these things I think can be more important than the performance, as long as the performance is at least some kind of baseline of okay. 
And this came from Jordan Tigani uh, at Mother Duck, uh, who, yeah, I thought that was a great excerpt. So I came across this like days before I wrote this and said, cool, I'm going to borrow that. So these are <coughs> the criteria I'm going to go through for each of the four. And I'll explain why for each one. The first is the operational mode. So this is whether it's centralized or using some other kind of model. Uh, the, this is just so you know how to actually deploy it and how it works, like pull, push, all that kind of stuff. The second is how the long-term data is being stored. So is it being stored on disk, or is it being stored in object storage, or is it being stored in SD cards, or <laughs> how is it actually being stored long-term? This has implications for uh, reliability, it has implications for cost, and so those are worth considering because you're going to be paying for this infrastructure anyway. Uh, the third is, does it support open telemetry native ingestion? So there are solutions for converting Prometheus metrics into OTEL format, but maybe you're pulling in metrics in OTEL native format anyway, and you'd like to keep it in OTEL native format, which is a totally valid ask. And so you want to know, do any of these backends support it, or only partially support it, or what's happening there? It's good for future proofing. The next is around uh, PromQL compatibility. So some of the solutions, including the, the commercial SaaS-based ones, will tell you that they accept Prometheus metrics and let you query in Prometheus uh, query language. Uh, but they don't actually have full compatibility of PromQL, which means you can't run all the same queries. They just don't work. And anytime you have to deviate from a full PromQL compatibility, that means you accrue technical debt because you're going to change your queries to match this other syntax that's needed for it to work. And it means if you ever move off of that solution, you have to change them back. So this is a, can be a very dangerous spot to end up in if they're not fully compatible. Next is the known scale. So I said performance is not enough, scale isn't everything. You might know what scale you, you need as a maximum, and maybe all these are larger than you would ever need, in which case it doesn't matter. But maybe it does. Um, so I tried to pull some kind of known online reference that says how far these can scale, at least in write. Uh, by write, I mean like write load. Um, querying is much trickier because while you can say, oh, we can ingest uh, 15 million series into our solution, uh, it's, we don't really necessarily have a standardized benchmark for the read path. Like we can publish benchmarks that say we did these kind of reads, but then the other solution says we did those kind of reads and the data can be different and the queries are different and so it's hard to measure those directly. So I don't have that one as one of these, but it could be something to consider as well. The next is multi-tenancy. So I said in one of the limitations why that's a problem or why it might matter to you. I have spoken to plenty of people for whom uh, it doesn't matter. They just want to dump everything in one tenant and they don't care. Um, but if it does matter to you, I have that here. The next is, can you, in, can you uh, utilize limits on a per tenant basis? Because you want to prevent team A from influencing team B. Uh, I've got a couple more. Native histogram support. Uh, native histograms are the updated Prometheus histograms. These are the ones with also called exponential histograms. I think there's another name, but it escapes me now. Native histograms is the official name. This is histograms that can have as many buckets as you want and only correspond to a single time series. Uh, that feature is actually still experimental in OSS Prometheus. So that means that any solution that has it implemented, it still officially can only be experimental because the underlying feature is experimental. But some of them have it and some of them don't. Uh, downsampling, this is when you want to reduce the resolution of the data over time. That's important to some people. Um, for different reasons. To some people, it's important for querying. It's easier to query less data points if you're trying to query over like years. And for some people, it's for cost. If we reduce the resolution of the data, we reduce how many data points we're storing, and so it's cheaper. Or that's, that's the thinking anyway. And the final one I have here is uh, how many releases have they done in the past two years? And I did it on minor releases. I didn't count patch releases. Uh, minor releases only. Not saying everybody does SEMVR correctly, um, but I counted it on minor releases. It's also not the most accurate metric though because some people put a lot into a minor release and some people don't. And some people put in breaking changes into minor releases and some people don't. So it's kind of not the best gauge, but it's an indicator, so I included it. So let me jump into them. So we'll start with Cortex, uh, not for any particular reason. The mode that this works in is a centralized cluster. So it actually switches the Prometheus model around from uh, scraping to uh, a push model. 
So that means you have to send data into it via the remote write protocol, which Prometheus supports. Uh, you can send that from not just Prometheus, but anything that, that can support that protocol. You can write your own curl script that does this if you want. Uh, but the main things people do this with are regular Prometheus servers. They can be configured to do that. They do that with the Prometheus agent. They do that with Grafana agent. You can configure the OTEL collector to write in remote write format. There's an exporter for that. You can do this with Telegraph. You can do it with tons of things. Um, so as long as it's in that format, this solution can accept it. I think they all can actually, but this one accepts it in that way, but it becomes a central cluster. You push the data out to it instead of it reaching in and scraping out. So it inverts the model. The second here is that the most recent data in Cortex is stored in block storage. So it means it's on disks. And then the long-term data is stored in object storage, uh, which makes it really cheap to store. Uh, and so the long-term data is just pulled in from there. There's fancy indexing going on and all that kind of stuff. There, there's not usually a huge concern with that, but if you are deploying, say, like on-premise on in your own data center and you don't have object storage available, well, this, this will probably be a problem for you. Um, so you should look into getting that. <laughs> Uh, the next is OTLP ingestion. So for this one, it's a work in progress. I was able to find an issue that indicated they are working on it, but it's not there today. Uh, PromQL, 100%. Perfect. So nothing to worry about there. Um, I will say the PromQL uh, indicator I have here, there is a third party company called PromLabs. And the last time they ran a big battery of these was a couple of years ago, but they tested well, a ton of backends with the same exact compatibility test. And that's how we get these results. So they basically said all these ones are 100%, these ones are not, and so on, and so I'm pulling from there. They're able to submit, the vendors can su submit their own results to that site and have them published, so I'm just going off of the, la the latest one that's up there. Uh, known scale for this one, I couldn't find a definite number. I found it to go up to millions of series, uh, which was fine, but I didn't get a specific number. They had a, there was a medium post from, sorry, was this the medium one? Uh, do, 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 do. No, they, they had a case study published from a company called Gojek, and they had listed millions, but not how many. So that's all I had to go on. Uh, the multi-tenancy, it is there. Uh, they do it via headers. So you use the Xscope org ID header. Uh, there isn't necessarily auth around any of these for any of these solutions by default. You can add your own auth layer. Like you can put a proxy in front and have it authenticate and then have that attach the header. You can do that and that works, but this doesn't have any auth by default. But the tenants are separated by this header data. So if you just write metrics with this header set, it just goes into that tenant. If a tenant doesn't exist, it will exist once you write something to it, just automatically. Uh, it does have per tenant limits. You can set all sorts of limits, like how many series can be ingested in each tenant. You can say how many, uh, how many labels can be on every metric, uh, a maximum. You can say how big they can be in various different types of sizes. You can set an ingestion rate. You can set all sorts of things. Uh, native histogram, not supported in Cortex yet, but is does seem to be under active development. It looked pretty far along, so that'll be there soon. Uh, they are also working on downsampling. I think it wasn't as far along, but it is something that's also currently being worked on in that project. And I found that they have about two minor releases per year over the last two years. So pretty good. Uh, next one here is Victoria Metrics. Bit different in a few different ways. Uh, in the mode, uh, it's the same as the previous one. So central cluster, remote write, accepts all the same things, works fine. Storage mode here is different. There's no object storage used in Victoria Metrics. Everything is done on disks. And this can mean, like, this can be viewed as a good thing or a bad thing. You could say it's a good thing because there's no dependency on object storage. That's one less thing you have to deploy. Uh, some people might say it could be a negative thing because object storage has a much higher reliability score than disks do. Disks fail more often than object storage does. So it depends on how important that is to you. Uh, uh, regular disks can be more expensive than object storage. Object storage is historically quite cheap, um, but of course that depends on how you use it. So good thing to consider. Uh, they have OTLP ingestion already released, so that's great. Uh, the PromQL compatibility is 74.16%. Uh, on that last PromLabs test. Uh, the way that this differs from the, no the Noki one that I mentioned in the, other, in the pre prior eliminations is that while Noki is working towards 100% compatibility, this appears to be a deliberate decision, uh, which is kind of a more unique take. So if you follow the GitHub issues, you'll find that what seemed to happen was the authors of Victoria Metrics 
uh, didn't like the way PromQL did some things, and so they essentially have like like a partial fork of the language um, called MetricsQL, where they did the things differently that they thought were better, uh, which is fine. It's a fair take, but it does mean that if you move to it, you have to change some query stuff, and if you move off of it, you have to change it back. So if you like how they do it, sure, go for it. Uh, known scale, I did find uh, an article on a Medium from Cr Criteo, or Criteo, I don't know how to say it, engineering, where they said they got it up to a billion active series, which is really cool. So pretty big scale. Uh, Multi-tenancy is there, but they gate the multi-tenant rules uh, in their enterprise edition. So you can send stuff to different tenants, but if you want alerting rules on a per-tenant basis or recording rules, you have to pay, which I thought was an interesting choice. Uh, Per-tenant limits, same thing. They only exist in the enterprise edition as well as getting statistics on a per-tenant per basis. Uh, native histograms are not there. Um, I couldn't find anything that indicated they were planning to add them. There was a GitHub issue where pe they were suggesting people to use their histogram version, like it was called like Victoria histograms or something like that, but they couldn't find any indicator that they were working on this. Uh, Dan sampling is there, but it's in the enterprise edition. Um, but their velocity is really high. So I found between five and 10 miners per year. So very active project, which is pretty cool to see. On to the third one, uh, Thanos. This is probably the most well-known one I th uh, that I'm aware of. I don't think like anybody who talks about scaling Prometheus always knows of Thanos. So it definitely has the most name recognition. Uh, this one has two modes. So it can run as a sidecar attached to Prometheus processes where it queries those Prometheus directly and sends it up to the cluster. That means that recent queries are actually live queried from these leaf Prometheus servers. But you can also send data directly into it uh, in a centralized model via the Thanos uh, receiver mode. And you can run both modes at the same time, depending on your use case. And maybe you have you know, limitations around um, network traffic directions and firewalls and all that stuff. So um, kind of versatile from that perspective. Uh, storage is similar to three out of the four, so block storage for recent data, uh, object storage for other data, uh, which is fine. It, it, it actually, there's a lot of code shared actually between Thanos and Cortex and Mimir around how data is stored in object storage. Um, so that's kind of cool to see, very, very open sourcey. Uh, OTLP ingestion doesn't seem to be being worked on right now. I found an issue where somebody said, I would like to work on this and nothing else. So I don't know where it stands. It's certainly not anywhere I could easily find. Uh, PromQL, 100%, perfect. Uh, I found for scale, I found uh, they have a case study published on their own on the Thanos site for, from a company called Medallia, where they say they got it up to a billion series in this with a crazy architectural diagram, but it, they said it got, up, it got up to a billion. I'm not here to validate the numbers. I'm just telling you this is what I could find. So that's cool. We've run stuff up to a billion and like it's, you can do it, but like it's, it's work. Uh, Multi-tenancy, they have it in Thanos, but it's done slightly differently. It's just using external labels. Um, so there, it's, it's a little looser. You're st you are storing everything in like a big TSDB instead of separate ones per tenant. Um, but it still can function, but it does depend on how you do your, like who has the control over your um, metrics infrastructure. Is that all controlled by a central observability team or is it controlled by individual teams? Because if it's individual teams and it's only done via labels, then there is room for them to do things that they shouldn't really be able to do. Um, but totally depends on what you need for your environment. Uh, per tenant limits, they have them as experimental, but only for the receiver mode because of the, the nature of it. So receiver mode is receiving stuff via push from remote write so they can push back. But if you're doing a sidecar mode, well now you're scraping and that's a different entire setup to have to put limits around. So it's a bit trickier to do that in. Uh, native histograms, they're in there, already done. Down sampling, in there, already done. Uh, so you can just take that and do that straight away. And the velocity is about three to four miners per year uh, over the last two years. So pretty good velocity as well. And onto the last one. So this is Grafana Mimir. The mode is similar to most of them. So it's a centralized cluster. You remote right up to it. Prometheus agent, Grafana agent, Telegraph, whatever, doesn't matter. Uh, the storage, block storage for recent, object storage for uh, the older data, uh, nice and cheap. OTLP ingestion, already there. Uh, PromQL, 
uh, known scale a billion series. We have a blog up on our site about running it up to a billion. Um, there's at least a couple of customers running it at, uh, who have run it up to a billion. I don't know if they do it all the time, but they have done it. Uh, Multi-tenancy, this is the same as for Cortex. Uh, if you're not familiar, Mimir was actually a fork of Cortex, so it inherits a lot of things from that, but this happened at, uh, in 2022. So in 2022, they were the same, and they've diverged since then, but the tenancy system existed prior to that, so it's the exact same system. Uh, as a result of that, same system for per tenant limits. We might have uh, different limits now, or added more, uh, but it works the same way. Uh, native histograms are already in. Uh, don't have downsampling today, uh, but it is something that we do plan to add. Uh, the way that, like, we actually put off working on downsampling for some time because most people who wanted it that we spoke to wanted it for cost-saving reasons. Uh, but in with the way that Mimir works and its use of object storage, the storage cost is actually less than 10% of the TCO. So it's not the area to spend a lot of time optimizing because the cost saving isn't going to be that high. Now the other use case, which is if I downsample the data, it will make long-term queries easier because there's less data to iterate over. That's more, that's more valid. That's why we are going to add it anyway, but definitely pushed it out because it wasn't going to help with TCO very much. And the velocity is about five, four or five minor releases per year. Uh, over the last two years, we're 2.12 I think is about to come out. I saw, an, saw, an, saw a release candidate up there already. So, um, yeah. Here's the big table, uh, which is, was fun to try and fit all this on the same page. I knew I'd see a few phones go up for that. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is the big table. Uh, this obviously is a point in time. This is how they are today or this week. Um, this will obviously change over time. Some of these features could uh, move from enterprise into OSS, or some of these numbers could change, or an architectures change, anything like that. Um, but as of this week, uh, this is all true from what I could find online. Again, if I'm wrong, it's wrong online. Don't blame me. <laughs> um, so there's lots of good options here. Uh, there is no single best answer, really. Uh, it really depends on what's right for your needs and what's important to you in your environment. There are things that you might care about that we don't care about, things that we uh, do care about that you don't care about. And the big thing is we're all just trying to use Prometheus and scale Prometheus because we like Prometheus and just want to keep using it and stay in that ecosystem and just you know keep everything working well and our monitoring functioning properly. All of these solutions work with Grafana, which is great. Um, love hooking up everything to Grafana as much as we can and this keeps uh, our little mascot here, very happy uh, to see it in use. So that brings me to the end. Uh, I can do some Q&A. Just wanted to highlight in the top left, my uh, colleague Ananya is doing a talk on incident response with OpenTelemetry at 6.15 today uh, in room 107. Uh, we do have a booth in the hall. If you haven't been in the hall, come to the booth. Um, I'll probably go there for a bit until Ananya's talk. So after I leave here, if you want to come ask me stuff, you can. And uh, yeah, if you want to check out some of our other open source stuff, it's on there. We've got something for logs, for traces. Uh, metrics is what I talked about today, but we have logs and traces as well. So I can talk about any of those with you. So other than that, I'll do questions. All right, I'll come up to you um, so we can record the questions as well. Is this working? Okay, go. Um, uh, is first of all, is this um, slide deck available anywhere for us? Not right this minute, but okay. <laughs> I probably could. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I was just curious. Um, and then the second question. Uh, no, I forgot. Never mind. Oh well. Thank you. First of all, great talk. Loved getting the overview of the whole ecosystem. Why do you think so many of the solutions you presented only use remote write sort of as their ingestion method, whereas Thanos has the sidecar alongside remote write? So the, the I, that wasn't like super loud because that mic is kind of weird, but no. the, the, it's okay. The question was, why do I think so many of the solutions use remote write 
as the ingested method, and Thanos is the only one using the sidecar method, uh, which is a great question. Um, I know why that is for Cortex and Mimir. So the reason for that is uh, Thanos existed before them. Um, Cortex was created uh, in part to uh, deliberately have a slightly different model to what Thanos did, because we liked Thanos, but we thought there were things about it that didn't work as well. So that model that Thanos has does function, but the fact that it then creates this, reli this reliance on all these leash Prometheus servers means that if you have an issue with those, you actually don't have a full picture of your data. So if there's an issue out in this network where this Prometheus is, and you want to query data that was coming from over there, it's not going to be present. Whereas if everything is pushed up to a central cluster, you always have access to all the data that's in there. Um, it does mean that you can also have your query time um, affected by one of these being slow, of these outer like Prometheus servers. And so when Cortex was being created, we did wanted to not do that. And so we did it the other way. Excuse me. Um, so it was a deliberate choice for that. Um, I can't speak to Victoria Metrics. I don't know why, th why they did it that way. Uh, thanks, for thanks for putting this together. Uh, I have two questions. The first question is, do all four of like the contending solutions all use Prometheus Adapter? Like, do they all use Prometheus what, sorry? Prometheus Adapter. Prometheus Adapter. Um, no, I think Prometheus Adapter, when I looked, it was only intended for, it was like OpenTSTB and Graphite and I think like one other one. Um, th that's what's listed on Prometheus I.O. for the Prometheus adapter. But do you mean like just for writing metrics into them? Or like, how, or you mean like how, how they're translating everything? Mm, so there's like the, the custom metric scaling. Uh, if you want to scale off of like Prometheus right. in Kubernetes uh, specifically, um, is it compatible with like, you know, Mimir or like Thanos? Oh, so can, can you use the, the, sorry, I was thinking of the Prometheus adapter. Uh, which is different to the metrics adapter, uh, uh -huh. totally different thing. <laughs> okay. um, so, like the, the like the the question is like, can I use the metrics adapter so I can use the like pod auto scaler uh, within Kubernetes? Uh, you definitely can for uh, Mimir and Cortex because um, I was working with uh, Mimir before when it was still Cortex and they both supported it. Um, I don't know for Victoria metrics because um, I haven't tried, um, but it should just be passing through queries like normal, so as long as your queries were valid, I think it should still work. Um, I don't know how it handles the the PromQL, but not quite PromQL part. That part could be a little could be a little different, or maybe it just passes them through normally and it works fine. Um, but the the other three definitely do work. Okay, uh, and then the second question was: um, I noticed that the Grafana agent and the uh, like the Open Telemetry collector are really similar, uh, but they're not quite the same. And I think there was like a fork at some point. What, what was like the is is there going to be like uh, compatibility between the both of them like throughout? So compatibility between the Grafana agent and the Otel collector? Yeah. So we, could we just use Otel collector instead of the Grafana agent? So um, the answer is you can. <laughs> the short answer is you can do whatever thing you want. Um, there's lots of ways to do it. Um, what happened was we originally created the Grafana agent as something more lighter weight than a full Prometheus server when you want to remote write metrics out. Because for many people, if they're going to remote write metrics out, they're not actually going to query that Prometheus server by itself. Um, so that Prometheus server having its own TSDB and query engine is redundant and a waste of resources. So the Grafana agent started out as Prometheus, but we ripped out the TSDB and the query engine and just kept the service discovery and the scraping and said, that's a Grafana agent right there. Um, it's come on a lot since then, but that's what it was like in like 2020. Um, in relation to, oh, and as a side note, the Prometheus agent was actually created after the Grafana agent as a subset of the Grafana agent. So we went to the Prometheus project and said, hey, do you want like an agent? And they were like, we don't want all this extra fluff that you put in there, um, but we'll take like the core bit, and that's the Prometheus agent. So it actually came in reverse order from Grafana out to Prometheus. Otel Collector is interesting because like it was a totally separate thing. But the Grafana agent actually includes now a ton of Otel collector components that you can optionally use. So you can use the Grafana agent and only use Prometheus-based components, or you can use the Grafana agent and use a ton of Otel components. And some of these are direct um, code copies over from the Otel collector project, so they work identically. Some of them aren't, because some of them are tweaked slightly to work better with like our solutions with less work on the user. Um, and so it's kind of a mishmash of like whatever you think you'd want to do. The, there's uh, an effort on our side to like 
we're kind of shifting towards like the Grafana agent is basically our distribution of the OTL collector because it includes all these pieces. So you can use either. You can certainly write with the OTL collector directly to our stuff. Um, you can use a Grafana agent. You can even do a mix. So I've seen people do a setup where they are collecting with the regular, uh, what do you call it, vanilla OTL collector uh, close to their, uh, their workloads. And then what they're doing is they're forwarding that into a Grafana agent. And then they're doing some uh, you know, modification of the data in there, some enriching of the data in there. And then they're sending it out to Namir or to our cloud or to, or to something like that. Um, and so like, you can kind of combo these things together in whatever Lego brick fashion you really want to. And everything works. Yeah, do you see concern uh, with the split between uh, Cortex and Mamira? Do you see concerns with the future of Cortex um, like development? Concerns with the future of Cortex development. So um, that's a great question. Uh, the if you if you were to go to the GitHub page for today, you'd see that the maintainer list is four people now. Uh, it used to be a lot larger when we were directly on it, but when we forked it, we all not I'm not I don't directly code it, but all the Grafana people moved off of it. Uh, after the fork happened. Um, I think like three of the maintainers work at Amazon because it, I think it is the basis for Amazon managed Prometheus. Um, and then one of them is at like Adobe, I could be wrong. Uh, there is an issue I found around like the CNCF was asking questions for them and they said that they have like a lot of extra contributors but they haven't added any new maintainers in a bit. So like I don't think I'm in a position to, to make like a lofty statement there but that like I think that is a valid question. Um, it definitely is still getting releases, which is why I included that they are doing two miners a year, so it's still moving. Uh, looking back at the table, though, it doesn't seem to have the same velocity, certainly. Like, it's doing releases, but not as many. Um, and I would say some of the, the major stuff they have in flight has been in flight for quite a while. So I'd say it's a slower moving project, but I wouldn't say it's, like, in massive trouble at the moment. Any other questions? Thank you, Amy. Thanks, folks.